Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with the rather wonderful Mr. Jason LaRocca. How are you? Good, how are you, Warren? It's good to see you again. Good to see you too. When was the last time we did this? I think it was a couple of years ago. 1840s? Yeah, somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah. Second age of Middle Earth, somewhere in there. <laughs> well, that's interesting because you are talking of that. How long have you been working on it? The new Lord of the Rings TV show. Uh, we started last November working on it, on the post side, mixing the music. We did over nine hours of music. Wow. So, yeah, it's pretty intense. I think every episode is a, about an hour, and, and we have an hour plus of music because we have end credit songs. So, wow. So it's been, been crazy. So the new months. stuff must be rolling in now. We finished it already. Oh, wow. We finished everything on our side. So, yeah, it's been a very intense last seven months. <laughs> That's incredible. Is that how long it's been? Is it just, yeah. has it been yeah. only that? Yeah. Or have you been? Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. How does that work? I mean, is it just Revision City? It's just a lot of tracks and a lot of music to deal with and revisions. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of it all, basically. Are you going down to the dub stage regularly, hearing it back? The dub stage uh, is not in this country. So oh, wow. <laughs> we dealt with, there was a lot of different time zones. Uh, it, there was, it was recorded mostly at Air and Abbey Road in England. And then the dub stages were in Australia or New Zealand. And we were here. Most of the music team was here. Bear McCreary was here and I was here. So we had a lot going on, a lot of teams and a lot of places to send us stuff, send them stuff. It was a lot of fun, but crazy. <laughs> That sounds absolutely nuts. Where did they where did they film most of it? I think they filmed it in New Zealand as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. All right. So can you give us an idea of how you do the busing? Because obviously for film and TV, you need to print a schnizzle ton of stems. Right. There's no way you're going to sit there with all of these things and just solo one track. No. And then print it with all its effects and then solo, which is probably what we used to do in the olden days of ten years ago. You could do that, but it would it would get you fired. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we have we have a lot of routing and, and busing. Basically, there's there's a template basically that I start with a lot of the time uh, that gets us kind of rolling, and it's got busing in it that's routing through five point one buses that out the gate it's already got some of these things going. So I'll have a track that's like a stereo track that comes from them, controlled by a VCA, sending into its own reverb and then going out of a 5.1 bus. So that's just for one particular sound. Let's see what this is. This is, uh... This is printed already. So if I solo this up... Okay, so this is one sound. So every element in this session, like this one, which is just a bell thing, this has to go down to its own 5.1 stem, or in this case, a 5.0 stem. So there's no sub on this one. But it starts out as a stereo track and then just goes to a reverb. So I send it to a reverb, and that reverb shows up in the rear speakers. So what started out as just one flat sound in the front speakers gets another set of channels to show up in the back speakers. I can solo this up and you can hear. That's the back speakers behind us. Wow. I know nobody can hear that, but behind us, it's great. So yeah, sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. Hopefully you can, because it sounds glorious. This is some of the routing that's in here. So this is, so the, basically it starts out as a stereo sound like, like this one that I showed you and goes through. I have a bunch of plugins on every channel by default, all deactivated. So it starts off basically looking sort of like that, where there's just nothing on when the channel comes to me. And then I can quickly EQ it if I want to without having to find the plugin. I just have it on the channel already. So every one of my channels in my template has a whole bunch of plugins that I typically put on that type of sound. Right. All, re all ready to go. So like an EQ or a compressor if I want that. Uh, just the you know spatializer if I want to have that. I have that ready to go. So I have all my plugins ready to go on that channel. It's routed through a bus that then prints to its own stem. So in this case, it's called the 
high pulse stem. So it gets sent from the high, what I call the high pulse pre, which is the bus that sends to my 5.0 EQ and limiter and then out to a print stem. So I do that for every sound that's in this particular. Does every sound have an EQ and so a limiter on it? Everything has an EQ, everything has a limiter, everything has a reverb, everything has a delay, mm -hmm. all discrete from any of the other sounds. So if anything needs to be on its own, it ha always has its own reverb, always has its own uh, delay, always has its own bus EQ compression and limiting. So you're using a VMR a lot. So what 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 are your uh, what are your it's kind of go-to? It's the only Slate plugin I have. <laughs> oh really? And so I use this as like my starting point. I, I just sort of feel like it gives me that kind of starting point Neve thing. Yeah. I, I really like this particular. I, I've tried all the emulations of consoles and stuff like that. They're all great, and there's a lot of great ones. I like the Brit N setting because I like the bump it gives on the low end and I like the bump it gives in the in the top end. So like mm. right out the gate, I've already got another 2 dB of... And you got a little bit of drive on it? Always have that as like my default setting. So six, whatever that means, as my drive setting. And that's on every channel. And typically that's on my mixes always by default. So like you can see every one of my channels has this Neve starting point. And then I'll EQ from there. I'll use, you know, I use this plugin a lot, which is, a, you know, a mono below the crossover point and stereo above the crossover point, and then you could widen it. So I like to make anything below 100 hertz or 150 hertz, usually mono. Right. A lot of sounds come in very stereo mm -hmm. and sometimes sort of phasey or out of phase almost. Yeah. And I like to really tighten that up. So like one of the first things I do is I put that on a lot of the sounds and I'll widen it out a little bit. So I just have a lot of plugins already ready to go so that I can literally within like 20 seconds just go down all the tracks in my session, put on whatever plugins I want, get them basically set, not think about it too much, but just get all the way down to the bottom, which is usually, you know, a couple hundred tracks or something like in this case, not that many. And once I get down to the bottom, then I start listening to the track as a whole and I start, you know, going, okay, where am I at with this thing? How's it looking to picture? And, you know, how's it all sounding as a whole? And I do a lot of it as, as a whole. I don't solo much up other than to just make sure in that first pass, I've got everything going where I want it and that there isn't anything technically going down a wrong stem or something like that. A lot of this routing is in my template. So a lot of the stuff we've already done test tones through, we know it's all discrete and not crossing through you know other stems or anything like that but a lot of it is in you know the pre-production ahead of time before we get to the mix side of it interesting so a couple of questions do you get any guidance do you get a rough do you get anything because yeah. Yeah, yeah okay so when i want to hear when i want to hear the demo i just always have it on a fader so like let me hear so back with full yeah, so i always have a, a rough since this instrument It's louder, which is a good start. <laughs> My mix is louder. <laughs> but anyway, yes, I always have a part of, of having the rest. There's a little bit of grit to it as well. It's louder, yeah. but it's just like it's that. It's a little more pushed and, you know, in. The violin and, just feels like I can hear the bow a bit. The rough also only has fake strings, and, and ah. this has a bunch of real strings. So, you know, right. to my credit, I have a lot more going for me in, in my mix. But, yep. you know, a lot of it's too just to make sure that I have everything in my session. So I check the rough just to make sure I've got every sound I'm hearing. Sure. So we go meticulously through it and just make sure that there isn't anything missing because they send us sessions that have, you know, sometimes hundreds of tracks that easily something can get lost right. in the shuffle and we you know we're missing a track or a track shows a blank and we always have the rough to you know go against and make sure that we've got everything the idea is that you want to make sure it sounds pretty much like the rough to start mm -hmm. with and then we take it from there and do the special stuff you know like put it in surround get it filled around the other speakers usually the the composer or the producer is is working purely in stereo. So when we work in surround or in Atmos, we're doing that extra thing that they don't have. So a lot of it is first matching it to the rough, making sure it's there, and then, okay, now let's spatialize it. Let's get it around the room. Let's fly it. Let's get it kind of filling up a lot more speakers. 
and then doing that, you know, adding live stuff because there's usually no live stuff in the mock-up. So there's a lot more tracks that we're usually either replacing mock-up strings and mock-up brass and mock-up choirs and stuff like that, or we're adding to them. So, you know, there's that next level of, okay, now let's add all the live elements and figure out where all that stuff fits in. And is this where occasionally you're mixing and then they're like, oh, we really need to add a tambourine or a background. We need an ooh here and, and you're dropping it in? Usually not idea things like that, because mm -hmm. usually once a composer gets something signed off by a director and producers, there really is no, let's add some tambourine to this track. I wasn't thinking so much about the composer, I was thinking of the director and producer. But going, if the director wants to, absolutely. Yeah, would, yeah for sure. And that, that's definitely happened where we've, we've had things so far down the line and thought it was done. And then the director says, cool, we're changing it or we're going to completely rethink this scene and, and let's go in a totally different direction. In fact, we've, you know, we've mixed things here with the directors here, even listening to the music and, and making sure that they, on a micro level, have it exactly the way they want. And they don't usually get into things like that, but sometimes we, we did a movie where the director was giving us hand claps, their own hand claps, to add into the music. And they were very particular about how they got added, how they sounded, and where they were. So we would finish a mix, and we would send them, and they would say, we'd like a hand clap taken out of the beginning, and we'd like one added to the end. And they were very meticulous about the way they felt about their and hand And it was composer, <laughs> mixer, a, it's a, hand clap. It's a rare case that that happens. But you know, usually the director is like, you know, do your thing with the music. I've signed off on, on, on the mock-up, you know, just make it sound great, and I'll, I'll listen to it, you know on the dub stage with the, uh, with the re-recording mixer. So usually the director isn't involved in you know, causing a stir in that regard. But sometimes it happens every once in a while. Some directors are also really great musicians and composers. Which is dangerous. J.J. Yeah. <laughs> Abrams is a, is a great musician. Yeah, they can have great input. They can have input that can be dangerous. I think if they know just a little or maybe not quite enough that they, they want to really kind of express that they feel they know a lot about keys and oh this should be changed to a different key and this and then they just sort of never let it go that that could be you know a little bit troublesome for us trying to finish the music and get it done i mean it was great but, but it could be a little bit more you know, orange a little more orange a little yeah. more gray a little more purple yeah. that's that's never fun to hear but in general i get to just you know i, I do my thing and it works out without having to get too many people muddling in with you know what I'm doing, and I don't usually have to have somebody here going, oh, yeah, yeah. I just do my thing and I send it out. Do you find that the longer you do this, the less you do? I spend about 10 minutes, 20 minutes on a song, and then I just park it and I'll move on to something else. I've gotten that down considerably from where I think it used to be for me, mixing-wise. If that's what you mean. Like, I feel like, I, I, for me, the, the process is about quickly getting something that I feel inspired about, loving it, but then not getting too far down the path of committing myself to something and then just parking it, going to something else and coming back to it later. Because I'll always have a slightly different perspective on what I did. So I like to do a first pass on something really, really fast, get happy with it, and then just park it and move on to something else. And I like to just sort of go through... And how many times are you doing that? Of doing that. I do it at least 50 times. Mm. I'll spend a good 12 hour, 14 hour day doing that, going through about you know, 15, 20 minutes of music where I like to just get through it all and then cycle back around from the beginning all the way to the end. Because it's a lot of material usually, you know, with film and TV music. It's, it's not like you're sitting there for three days on, on a kick drum or on one song. Right. You know, you're getting the sound of what typically is a 60 minute in a way, you can almost think of it as a single piece of music. It's a 60-minute, you know, arc, basically, of music that is more or less kind of one song. It's broken up into a great many songs. So when I think of it, I have to think of it as a whole. Otherwise, you could get really kind of painted into a corner if you just sit there on one song thinking you've got it done, and then you don't really hear how this thing ends at the end of the show or at the end of the movie. You haven't really gotten the full arc of it. So I like to go through layers of it and really get that sort of process in fast layers rather than focus too long on one thing. Are you, if they're using external music, like 
pre-recorded tracks, yeah. famous songs or something yeah. like that. Are they given to you as well to maybe EQ so it feels like it's part of a whole? Sure. I mean, sometimes we're adding orchestra or new elements on top of those things. So we get the stems for them and and mix those in. Or sometimes they're songs that are songs made for the film. And so they have song elements and band elements plus orchestra. So there's there's a composer involved plus the songwriters at the same time. We did this song called uh, Guns Go Bang for a movie called uh, The Harder They Fall last year, which Jay-Z and Kid Cudi sang on, which was a song written for the film. And... And that was pretty cool because the composer, who also was like the director and, and producer of the film, he was very hands-on with collaborating with them on the song level and then brought a whole orchestra in to play on top of it too. And then when I mixed it, it was like in the film as part of the film, but then also a song at the same time. So it was, it was doing a lot of different things at one time. But sometimes we're just, yeah, adding some layers on top of a song that is a famous song you might know, but then we're just, you know, doing something to change it at the very end and bring it out to the end credits or something like that. So we had a flourish of orchestra. And I've had some pretty cool, you know, uh, vocal tracks come in that have been like, dang, soloing up Elvis. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So it's pretty fun. You mixed some Elvis? We did do something. Uh, and it was a song that didn't end up getting used for a film, but but uh, it was a multi-track of, of Elvis that was pretty crazy to solo up and listen to. I can imagine. I mean, it was like bleed on everything. So like he had a good amount of bass, uh, you know, upright bass in, in, his, in his mic. And then the drums were, I think the drum, what was it? Drums and piano? I don't, the, the piano might have been isolated, pretty isolated actually. Just a four track recording was fantastic. Lots of bleed. And, re, and all the reverb and everything was all in there. It was incredible. So cool. It was incredible. It was amazing. Yeah. So sometimes you get those treats. This is, this is the, the real life. <laughs> this is the real of, stuff. Of yeah. Kids back in the days without gadgets yeah. and whatnots. I mean, we, we used to travel uh, from LA to, because my, my parents grew up in New York. And then right. they moved here in 1979 and they had me. And so we, I grew up here, but their entire family, my mom had uh, three sisters and two brothers and my dad had sisters and, and parents all in New York. So we would go to New York in the summer and we'd drive there because it's cheaper. And we would just, I had a Walkman. That's all I had to like, Oh, wait, you weren't rich because you were a Walkman. Well, I mean, you know, a cassette Walkman <laughs> wasn't that bad. You know, okay. because when the CDs came along, that was harder to get. But the, yeah. but the cassette Walkman was all we had. We had no gadgets. We had no nothing. So it was like me and my headphones for nine hours. Of a well, I've got 10 years on you. So I'm ten, 10 years old. And so what, I, what we had was um, I had my granddad's AM radio with the single earbud. Sure. But well, the good thing is I had long hair. When it wasn't trendy to have long hair. Yeah. And so I put the earbud up through, got my hair to cover it, and I'd sit there. You know, it was AM. It's like, everything sounded like this. But I would sit there in the middle of a lesson listening to, you know, a rock station. And this was just like an old, like, transistor? No, it was like one of those little, oh, oh, actual little AM portable. radios. Yeah. So I put it in my jacket. Yeah. And just with the thing up. And yeah. Be sitting here like this, terrified they could see. Yeah. Not that any you know any particular teacher was paying attention to me but i'd be like terrified but i was sit there it was totally it was wah, 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 you when know. you're in school yeah, yeah. well the, you remember because the generation after was it was it was an am radio but it was the cassette at the same time so it was a combo oh. so if you were if you were bored of listening to cassette you could tune into am too ah. and it was like the little the little knob on the top that you'd scroll by and you'd you'd get the actually it was very much like this I have one still, but it nice. was like, well, I mean, this was a little bit older, yeah, but yeah. you know, you couldn't put it in your pocket, but it was like the scrolly thing, you know, the little knob thing. Yeah. Like yeah. This I remember. Where you tune, tune. yeah. I remember those so well. if, the, if the cassette tape broke or whatever, you still had something you can rely on until you got home. Nice. <laughs> so uh, do we talk, well, last time we did this, do we talk about your punk rock beginnings and bands and we stuff? We probably like talked that? a little bit about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing. Cause now you're like doing like major motion picture stuff. It's all very. It's very confusing. Well, no, it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, you know, you could say it's unpunk rock, but at the same time, it's pretty punk rock. Totally. To come from that yeah. to doing that. Yeah. It actually kind of exemplifies what punk rock's about. Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't have like a traditional schooling background when it came to engineering and stuff. So like I came through just being somebody who was making it 
work in, in a very different context. You know, we were we were a band and and in our bedroom trying to figure out how how can we get signed or whatever. How can we sell a couple of records at our show or something? So we just made our first couple of demos and whatnot in our bedroom. And I I bought a you know the first thing I got was a Porter Studio Four, which was just like you nice. know two mic inputs and that was it you know and you had the the mic preamps and the four channels and that was you know what we made several recordings on we how did you record drums an overhead okay. and a kick mic and that nice. was it we made some terrible recordings on that and we had uh, another cassette deck that we would record too so if we wanted to make copies of it we had to make you know manual copies of, of our recordings so we did that and that was this sort of like I was always the the guy who had to figure out the technical side. Like no one else in my band wanted to figure it out. Yeah. So I was just kind of driven by necessity to just sort of go. I okay, relate to that totally. Yeah. I have to because this is what I want. I want to you it's know the I want to be though, isn't it? I want to be like you know I want to be cooler than the other band that we're playing with and and sound as good as we possibly can. So I was always thinking how can we have that edge up? You know, buy some cool mics. You know, save up for some good better amps you know it was always that was always like my way of like having the edge up on so what was the mics you had do you remember i had we bought the first thing we got was audio technica like a basic mic kit that was i think 150 dollars. it was a kick mic two like clip-on tom mics and a and a vocal mic that was also a snare mic so you probably could, actually kind of cool. Could use it for either one, basically. Yeah. I think I ended up using the tom mics for overhead, sort of between the overheads and the toms, and we had only two inputs at one point until we got a cooler mixer. So it was just, you know, very, you know, ad hoc and you know, low grade to begin with. I mean, we had you know a couple of mic cables that sometimes we'd find them from venues or steal them from somebody or whatever. We had. It's just like whatever we could do to figure it out. And that just sort of stuck for me. I just kind of became that guy, like the guy who would engineer stuff or I would do sound for like our friends' bands at venues or backyard parties. And it just was like one of those things was like, I wasn't necessarily great at it, but I got good at it by just doing it a lot. And, you know, had that sort of ear for, I think I know what I want and I think I know how to get it, but I'm not, you know, I just, it was all just a matter of sort of figuring it out through the experience of what we were going through and never really formally kind of necessity as the mother of invention you just a little bit you had to do it so you just figured it out yes what was that? for me i remember actually adats was the first big sure was that was that same thing for you sure well when i got my first real studio job it was working for um film composer Mark Isham. And that's how I got into the film world. Because I was in the punk world and doing records and wanted to be in a band, but that was my first like studio job. And I knew nothing about film composing at all. And he had two racks of D88s. He had a 32-track oh, yeah. uh, uh, rack of them and a 16-track rack. So he didn't have the ADATs, but he had the D88s, which was basically, they came out roughly around the same time. And the D88s were arguably sort of sonically better or whatever. But that was what I cut my teeth on when it came to the sort of digital tape thing. But we had, you know, we had DAT tapes, of course. So everything yep. that we mixed went to DAT tapes and we had thousands whatever of them that just that. never did anything. You know, they just sat in a drawer somewhere. Yeah. Um, and at the time, I remember I got my first DAT machine and I was really proud of it because I had to save up for about four or five weeks, actually, to buy a dat tape machine which was at the time like eleven hundred dollars i think you can give them away now for free or you probably can't even find them but for me it was like a really proud moment to have a dat tape machine which of course is useless now but the dat <laughs> the d88s were, were my thing and I, they were so problematic I mean, they were such a pain in the ass oh they were well just like you know the tapes would jam and then you know getting them fixed was uh, you know pain in the ass they weighed like you know what seemed like a hundred pounds, you know, to pull one out of the rack and fix it. People always used to complain about ADATs. I don't know if I just got lucky, but my, I never had any problems really? with mine. Really? Yeah. That was a strange one. I know that uh, Alanis Morissette cut that yeah. famous record on, on ADATs. I went to go see Glenn Ballard talk about the Alanis Morissette record, and he was talking about how great ADAT was. Mm -hmm. And he was like, it's the greatest thing ever. It's incredible. We recorded this album on it. And he's like, and you could... You know, if a track is off and ahead of 
another track. You can offset it and do these great things with it. And they played back the album. I remember everyone just thinking, this is like incredible, but it was like ADATs, like no one even cares about it. Chris, <laughs> Vogel, <laughs> like, <laughs> Chris Vogel talked to me about that and, and talked about Flea being so ahead on, was it on You Ought to Know? Yeah, Did they probably. offset him to just leaning back a little <laughs> bit into the track? Yeah. Well, the musicians are incredible on that album, but yeah. it's just funny that that album was cut on ADAT. If you listen to it now, it's like, whoa, you can you can hear the ADAT. There was an album that he started with Aerosmith that he didn't finish, and that was all on ADAT. And, oh, really? Yeah, and with, with a band, like a classic rock band like sure, that, sure. they're doing hundreds and hundreds of takes. Yeah, can you yeah. imagine what it must be like? Yeah. Like open up a, like a storage room of like 500 ADATs. Right, and then of course Everything they've got labeled. Like, <laughs> 32 tracks of them or whatever you could yeah, do. Exactly. So it's like for every tape, you've got three slaves and whatever. I mean, my friend Brian Colstrom worked on a, uh, God Rest His Soul, worked on a Billy Idol record that took like a couple of years. And he said it was like hundreds of reels of two inch. All I can think of all these kind of nightmare scenarios is thank God we have, you know, DAWs now and like, New nightmares. Hard. Yeah, new nightmares. But, <laughs> but you can have like records, not just a record, but several albums on one sure. hard drive. It's sure. Times have changed. Yeah, they really have. Like even having to have arrays of hard drives was an era that is nice to have behind us too. So you've got a lot of outboard gear, so you're not I using have some it? some stuff, yeah, but I don't really use it. I mean... You don't use these lovely Chandlers? It's mostly just mic preamps now. So if I record stuff, like if I go to a studio, I'll bring that stuff. And we have a tracking booth, so we can, you know, we just need some mic preamps if we need to do vocals and cellos and stuff. So you got the 1073 if you're doing some vocals or something? Yeah, that's that's actually the talkback mic is going through one of the 1073s. <laughs> but yeah, we've got the 1073. Well, that was actually the first preamp I bought was the 1073s. Love those. And the Grace 8 channel, which is below that. And that's remote controlled. The Very Mew? And the Varimu, which I used a lot to do mixing and mastering for, but I, I, now I just use the plugins. You know, I, that's a really great. I mean, that's the custom mastering Manly Massive um, Varimu, and it's so it's all stepped and everything. Yeah, and I, I, I actually there is something that that particular compressor does that the plugins don't do, but I've just gotten a way of driving the plugins now that I I just. I love having the ease of being able to recall my mixes and, and have them be exactly where I last left them. <laughs> it's, no, I hear you. It's just become my thing, you know? And I, with film and TV, you really kind of don't have time to problem solve things. And, and when things aren't working, they're just way too much of a nuisance when 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 people want something immediately you have no time to figure it so if if something comes back a half db quiet on the left or a db off somewhere it's it's a major catastrophe you know in film and tv because you have no time to fix it if you've sent it off that's it you're done so you know i think the stakes are just too high for me these days with things going flying in and out of here that i, I just don't mess with the analog gear that much anymore right. plus you need 50 of them if you're ever going to do anything useful in, in film and tv oh, absolutely because <laughs> everything's a stem you know not, you can't pass everything through a very view you know you have to like have bass stem go through the very you have to have the guitar stem go and then this and this so do you create a lot of Bussing inside of it, yeah. so you can actually print all your stems at Tons once. Tons of bussing. So we have a whole mastering stem series for every single food group of sound, basically. And if it's if it's a stereo mix, it's fairly easy. But if it's you know surround mix for film and TV, or like with Lord of the Rings, it's, that's all surround. You know, so it's, so we have a five point one or seven point one or bigger uh, bus for every single food group of sound. So this is the latest Lord of the Rings. that's just Came out, what, last week? That's right. Uh, yeah, a couple days ago. A couple days ago, yeah. yeah. The second. That's all, you know, when it gets into surround channels, you're at least six channels per bus. So to have any analog gear be part of that signal chain just becomes completely impractical, basically. Because that's how you have to deliver it, ultimately. Somebody has to be able to edit that material, change it just slightly uh, on the dub stage or where they're doing the final mix with the dialogue and with the sound effects. So you don't deliver just a stereo mix and that's it. You know, they, they have the control of all these other things that they want. It's uh, a lot of the, the work for product production like that is like all in the pre-production, like setting these things up, building a template that is like designed to. So I'm looking around and yes. thinking to myself, so stemming, you're, you're working in surround then. 
Yeah, yeah. Not Atmos. In this room, this is just surround, yeah. This is uh, are you are they asking you to mix this series in in Atmos as no, well? No, this is a, the 5.1. The, the whole mix is in 5.1. The final delivery is 5.1 for Lord of the Rings. Can they break it out anymore if they have to? I suppose they could, but I think primarily a lot of the Amazon content is in 5.1. I think, well, at least this series, that's how it ended up. So they haven't adopted Immersive yet. Well, well when they do, you'll be even busier. We'll have to do the whole thing over again. <laughs> add, just to add some ceiling channels. Yeah. Why not? With the way that the speakers are set up like that, I mean, it, I suppose it is giving you sound all over the place anyway, isn't it? Yeah, this is, I kind of have it set up sort of like a theatrical layout. The surround sound channels are up a little bit higher than yeah. if, if, if we were mixing in Atmos, we would have them all at the same level as the LCR. Yeah. So yeah. they would go all around and they would be at the same level. Well, I was going to put ceiling channels in, but because I'm here at Fab Factory, the illustrious Fab Factory, there's Atmos rooms yeah. all over the place all now. The place, yeah. So there's one literally three feet from me. So if yeah. I need to mix something Atmos, I can go in there, which is 914. Or there's the Atmos Theater, which is 1116. So, and, and we listened to the Lord of the Rings in, in that room and it sounds fantastic in there too. So it's like, I'm, I'm really confident with what I hear on these speakers, Great. you know, the translation between. Are these ATCs? These are Myers. Oh, they're Myers. They're okay. Meyer I was trying Astros. to figure out what they were. Yeah. So these, these speakers are meant to kind of be another 15 feet away from your ear. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're like, Sonny, I, I you, need some know, loud speakers in here. It's, it's, <laughs> the, it's the way it kind of, the cookie crumbled in here. But so they could, you couldn't get the ones with the big horns? <laughs> yeah, this, this is the <laughs> smallest they had. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is, but it works out, you know, you can stick your Same Mike there. Myers movie. Yeah, that's that? right. It's got to make it I, I ordered the large <laughs> coffee. <laughs> Goo. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these speakers are really powerful. I mean, you could never distort these speakers. If you did, you'd probably lose your hearing first. Is there a sub with them? There's a there's the 18 inch. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the X400, and wow. I have I have a rack mount QSC system, which basically does all the crossover and EQ in the room. Wow. So the room is EQ. Dolby has it EQ'd yep. so that it translates to larger theater size. Um, you know, the speakers have specific delays in them from the front and all that to kind of give a sense of larger space. Thanks ever so much. That was Thank a lot you. of fun. It's great to be here. Actually, you're in my studio. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's still great for you to be here because <laughs> if I come here and you weren't here, it would suck. It wouldn't make any sense. I'd be interviewing a, uh, a pair of speakers. Well, actually, more than a pair. It's a good thing I showed up. Yeah. Thank you very much for showing up. All right, everyone. So long. Farewell. Have a good day. Au revoir. Adios. Goodbye. Peace. Peace. Juice. Tootsines. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs>